My name's Ken Ramsey. Um, I flew jet fighters as opposed to the uh, planes these gentlemen flew. Uh, the F-100 Super Sabre. If you were out in a <coughs> hangar, you saw it way in the far corner with a camouflage paint job, etc. We had actually had a survival kit. The seat you sat on was a survival kit. It carried, it had a, a life raft. It had, we carried a May West type survival gear under armpits. It had a sleeping bag. It had food. It had radios. It had a knife and other things. So if we bailed out somewhere, we did have some pretty good equipment to um, survive with as they, as they upgraded the, uh, the planes. But survival is an interesting thing. Back in the Korean War, after the Korean War, they found out that our servicemen who were captured did not do well in uh, the survival situation of a prison camp. In fact, we had a lot of them died, just died. They weren't injured. They weren't uh, sick. They just gave up. Contrary to that, the Turks did not lose a single person in prison camp in Korea. The military decided we need to train these guys and what it's going to be like to uh, be in a prison camp, to be in a survival situation. So they initiated survival schools throughout the country. Air Force had a survival school. The Navy had, had their deep water survival school. The Army had desert survival school and forest survival school, mountain survival school, etc. So all of the uh, um, services had their individual survival schools. And they did a lot of cross-training. Air Force guys went to sea survival school if they're going to be flying over water, etc. I went to the Air Force Survival School in Reno, Nevada, back in June of 662. It's a three-week course. First week was classrooms and stuff. Second week, you're in a prison camp. The third week, you're out in the middle of the mountains trying to survive and get from point A to point B. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but a couple of interesting things came out of it. The first survival manual they had, they didn't have a survival manual when they started these things. They needed a survival manual. Well, what do you use? That's the Boy Scout handbook from the late 50s. It had a cover on it that said Air Force Manual 65-4, survival. But inside was the Boy Scout handbook. That was the only thing they had. Now, the current manual obviously is about, there's nothing in here about living in a prison camp, obviously. But the other things about how to make a campfire, how to make a bed, how to make a shelter, what kind of food you can eat, what kind of food you can't eat, etc., are all in here. Even today, the current manual has some excerpts from the Boy Scouts handbook because that's, you know, uh, the, the same. This, and the second week was uh, prison camp. And they actually had a prison camp there. And you've probably seen movies and things about how they treat prisoners, etc. Well, that's how we were treated. I lived in, a, in a, a room that was, I'm, I'm kind of short, I'm only five foot seven, but I could lay diagonally across this room, a little bigger than a phone booth. I could lay diagonally across that room with my feet touching one corner and my head touching the other. Think, think of someone who's six feet tall. <laughs> and they'd knock on the door. If you didn't answer, that meant you were asleep, so they'd throw a bucket of water on you. They'd take your wedding rings. They'd take anything, personal things. they tried to get you confessed for bombing a hospital. They put you in a tank of water that was about 10 feet deep, four foot on a side, and they'd drop you in the water. And so if you held, held on the edge like this, they step on your fingers. If you treaded water to stay up, they'd push your head down. Uh, all sorts of things, take your food away. All these kind of things, trying to break you and uh, try and see how you did. The third week was going from point A to point B, about 10 mile hike in the, in the mountains. And the only thing you had was the survival stuff that you would have if you bailed out of your airplane. So we had a sleeping bag, a down sleeping bag. We had a parachute. We didn't, obviously, we didn't need a life raft. We had some of the survival rations, etc. And we had to go from, again, hike about 10 miles with just a, just a map. Plus, all the instructors were now the enemy, and they're out trying to get you. If they caught you, they'd take you back to the beginning. You had to start all over again. So it was kind of a, a tough thing, but we all survived. The interesting thing was at the graduation ceremony, the instructors had identified five people who had survived better than anybody else in the class of 42. We were the only five Boy Scouts in the group. Uh, survival uh, yourself, you think, okay, these guys have been through wars. 
I, I was never, I was in Vietnam, but I didn't get shot at and didn't shoot anybody um, flying, flying our fighters. And we flew, uh, they were flying high altitude, low altitude. We flew anywhere from 45 to 50,000 feet down to 50 feet. We had some missions that were lower than the cockpits of some of the bombers we got out here. 50 feet at 400 knots is exciting. <laughs> um, but you think of yourself, you know, well, chances of any of you being in the military is, you know, probably one or two might uh, in a survival situation like uh, these guys were in. Uh, probably remote. But think about this. Like coming to driving to the museum today, sometimes we're here late at night driving home and you get a snowstorm and you get your slide off the road going to school going to visit your parents, something like that. You slide off the road and it's 10 below zero. You are now in a survival situation, something you didn't plan. So you might think of, particularly during the wintertime around here, you might think of having some survival stuff in your car or in your parents' car. You know, a blanket is nice. Now we, we carry in my, my wife and my wife's car, we carry a blanket for two people. If we have uh, taking somebody or going on a trip, one of our grandkids on it, we throw another blanket in. We keep a candle in the glove box, along with a Bic lighter or matches. You can buy at a store, we have a store up in, I live up in Solon, by the way, uh, called Mark's. You can buy eight Bic lighters for a buck. <laughs> you know. But you can, if you're in a survival situation in the middle of nowhere at night in the cold, you can light a candle inside your car and that'll keep you warm enough to survive the night. You want to have a window open a crack to let more oxygen in, but uh, that's something you do. We have blankets in the car. We always have gloves and stuff. So something you might think about living in northern Ohio where it gets pretty darn cold and snowy and slippery. Uh, we just had uh, up at the Cuyahoga County Airport where I fly, we just had an airplane slide off the runway yesterday. You know, you just, you just never know with the, the slippery stuff around here.